The Pakistani Prime Minister gets the Trump treatment at the White House. Did this meeting spur more controversy than remedy for the frayed relationship between the US and Pakistan? I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is Imran Khan's visit to the Oval Office. Donald Trump used his first tweet of 2018 to scold Pakistan's leaders, saying the U.S. gives them billions and they give the U.S. nothing but lies and deceit. An online brawl ensued between Trump and Imran Khan, setting up a renewed rivalry between the two nuclear powers. Khan went on to become prime minister and Trump suspended aid. Now Pakistan's leader has had to come to the White House with hat in hand, with the aim of securing a boost to his crippled economy. Some argue the U.S. too needs Pakistan's help in dealing with the Taliban. But if Khan was hoping the headlines would read, Trump open to restoring financial aid, that would not be fake news. Except it still didn't make the headlines. Instead, it was all about Trump touting an unlikely offer to mediate peace in Kashmir while casually mentioning a plan to kill 10 million people in Afghanistan. So where does this leave relations between the two sides? Haider Abbasi reports. It's America's longest war. For nearly 20 years, the U.S. has been fighting in Afghanistan. But they don't have much to show for it. The Taliban not only hasn't been defeated, it controls significant territory. And their fighters are still able to launch devastating attacks. Now the U.S. is trying to find a way out. Enter Pakistan. Many analysts say there can be no end to the conflict without Islamabad. And Prime Minister Imran Khan seems to know this. We hope that uh, in the coming days we will be able to uh, urge the Taliban to speak to the Afghan government and come to a settlement, a political solution. Pakistan has helped persuade the Taliban to negotiate with the US. There have been several rounds of talks already. Trump seems to be pushing for a peace deal before he's up for re-election next year. Since American forces invaded Afghanistan in 2001, at least 2,400 U.S. personnel have been killed. The U.S. still has about 14,000 soldiers there. One study says the war has cost Washington $840 billion, and at least 147,000 Afghan civilians have been killed. This is Prime Minister Imran Khan's first personal meeting with the US president. Since Trump's been in power, he's been highly critical of Pakistan. Last year, he accused Islamabad of being a safe haven for terrorists. The US later suspended around $2 billion in military funding to Pakistan. So I think we have a better relationship with Pakistan right now than we did when we were paying that money. But all of that can come back depending on what we work out. And it's money that Khan needs. Pakistan's economy is suffering. The rupee lost 35% of its value last year, and prices on basic goods are rising. At the start of the month, Khan secured a $6 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund, but it's not enough. The Financial Action Task Force graylisted Pakistan last year for not doing enough to stop the financing of terrorism. Others on this list include Syria and Yemen. Khan wants Trump's help to get Pakistan off the list. Just days before Khan's visit to Washington, Pakistan arrested Hafiz Saeed. He's accused of masterminding the 2008 Mumbai bombings. 166 people were killed in the attacks. But critics say Saeed has been arrested and freed several times before. So is Pakistan really getting tough on militant groups? And will Pakistan's involvement in the Afghan peace process be enough to restore political and financial ties with the U.S.? Haider Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, let's start off the conversation with Sajad Burki. He's the president of the U.S. chapter of Imran Khan's ruling PTI party. Good to have you on The Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us. Were there any surprises in this visit for you? Th uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, no, the surprise, the biggest surprise was the number of people that we got there um, in the arena the other day. 
nobody expected that many Pakistanis to show up and uh, greet their prime minister. Uh, there were estimates of maybe we'll get maybe five to 7,000, but we worked so hard. I think we had a number of over 20,000 people, anywhere from 20 to 25, who came on to cheer the prime minister. With Prime Minister Imran Khan, when we look at his track record before he became Prime Minister and in the early days of becoming Prime Minister, for a long time, he was arguably the most anti-American Pakistani leader you can find. Yet uh, not much criticism of the United States when he sat next to the U.S. president. Tell me what's going on there. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to differentiate that a little bit. I wouldn't classify him as an anti-American leader. He was more of an anti-American Afghan policy leader in Pakistan. Every time he criticized uh, America was in relation to the Afghan policy that was going on. He was criticizing uh, the American policy of uh, the drones, of uh, killing people over there, of bombing areas in that in the Afga in Afghanistan. So I, I wouldn't classify that as sure. anti-American. But that, but that policy still continues. Pro-Pakistan. Certainly, that policy still continues. That policy absolutely Certainly. still continues. Okay, but as yes, he sits does. there as prime minister, yeah. is the reason he's playing nice with Donald Trump because he needs money and Pakistan desperately needs a financial injection from the United States? Well, not only that. I think uh, there are many things that they're working on. Of course, we want um, a resolution with the situation in Afghanistan. That'll help us. Uh, we also want a resolution uh, with India on the Kashmir issue so that the prime minister can focus on their economy, on the people in Pakistan. And if we can get peace somehow in that region, uh, we will begin to prosper economically. And uh, you're right, yes, and a certain injection of, of funds is desirable. It is needed for them because our previous government just totally bankrupted us. Uh, you know, we inherited uh, a government that was in extreme debt, uh, and just a debt servicing is, uh, is so huge mm -hmm. that it's an Im immense burden on the economy. As the Prime Minister heads back to Islamabad, what has he actually gained from this trip? I think it's a win-win situation. Uh, firstly, the thaw in the relationship between Pakistan and the U.S., uh, the tensions that we kept hearing about, I think some of those have cleared up, and uh, the people in Pakistan would be glad to hear that that's been taken care of. Uh, second, uh, like you said, the there was some definitely talks on helping the economy in Pakistan, trade relations, as you saw, uh, President Trump uh, said our trade could go up 10 to 20 times, uh, a huge boost for Pakistan. And thirdly, if we can somehow start a dialogue with India uh, on the Kashmir conflict, uh, that'll be tremendous. But that'll do you helpful. think that, that that actually came from something substantive or Donald Trump was just shooting his mouth? Because that seemed to come out of nowhere. The Indians even said they didn't that they didn't ask Donald Trump to mediate between India and Pakistan. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm not privy to that, but uh, that's the, the statement the president made. Uh, I know there's been denials from the Indian side, but then again, uh, this is something that Pakistan has been asking of for a very long time, that, you know, we need a mediator so that we can begin to talk. We can bring the issue on the table. And, uh, you know, it's it just like the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, the, Imran Khan uh, almost 15 years ago started saying that the only resolution to that conflict in Afghanistan is for people, by people sitting on the table and talking, not by bombing them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and now, suddenly, everybody seems to forget that. He's the first one. He was criticized for it. He was called Taliban Khan. He was, uh, you know, the, the people thought that he was siding with the, 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 the Taliban leadership over there. But what he really wanted all this time was the war to stop so that a good 
dialogue could begin, right. and that's how you uh, bring uh, these conflicts to resolution. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Afghanistan and if there will be an increased Pakistani role in the negotiations and dialogue there. Sajad Burki, good to have you on the Newsmakers. I thank you very much for joining us. Well, let's broaden out the discussion now. In Washington, D.C., we have Farnaz Ispahani, who's a former member of Pakistan's parliament and was the advisor to President Asif Ali Zardari. In Islamabad, we have political commentator Muid Pirzada. And in Washington, D.C., is political analyst Adam Weinstein. He's also a former U.S. Marine who served in Afghanistan. Good to have you all joining us on the program. Farnaz Ispahani, you know, Trump called Pakistan liars, thieves. He said Pakistan steals the aid money. It helps terrorists. Has this trip, this visit by Prime Minister Imran Khan done anything to convince Trump otherwise and maybe bring Trump more on board to having the relationship as it used to be? Well, let's look at one thing. Um, yes, I think the meetings between Prime Minister Imran Khan and President Trump yesterday went swimmingly on the public front. But, you know, President Trump also said he loved King Jong-un and, um, you know, thinks he has a great thing going with North Korea. The thing we do need to calm down and focus on is what does the U.S. establishment think? There is a very deep well of antagonism against Pakistan for years of broken promises for um, shoring up the Taliban, for its protection of Masood Azhar, who, you know, by the way, he was picked up and it was heralded. But it was the seventh time he'd been picked up. And he was, he's been released every time in uh, the past. So, you know, I love cheering and I love the fact that people feel good as Pakistanis, that the Pakistani prime minister had a great reception. But, you know, President Trump is a populist leader, much like President Khan, Prime Minister Khan. But, you know, do what they say in public mm -hmm. have that much effect on policy? I don't think so. The U.S. establishment is still very, very angry and disturbed by Pakistan's role in um, housing, feeding, and training terrorist groups that have attacked uh, Afghanistan, um, have shored up the Taliban and the Haqqani <clears throat> group, which is one of the U.S. demands. And, um, you know, also um, India is extremely unhappy um, with this. And India in the U.S.-South Asia strategy and policy has been considered the biggest ally in the region. Right. Muid Prezada has Farnaz Ispahani accurately analyzed the state of play. Uh, Imran, uh, to the extent that uh, she points out that it's a very uh, complex relationship, uh, Imran Khan administration, the Prime Minister Imran Khan's government is not necessarily a government that Washington has looked on very kindly. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister Imran Khan and his party uh, when they were agitating against Prime Minister Imran, uh, Nawaz Sharif, uh, the U.S. media, the U.S. think tanks, the U.S. government were very, very critical of them. So when this uh, party came into power, um, uh, it was generally thought that Washington is not very, uh, is not very, it doesn't look very kindly on this government. So the most important thing that has happened uh, in the last two days is that a meeting took place between President Trump and between the Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, and which, which actually went smoothly and positively. Within Pakistan, Imran Khan has gained tremendously uh, as a result of the comments, the positive comments, which uh, the, the American president has actually said. Mm -hmm. Also, the Capital One Arena uh, demonstration with almost 20,000 plus Pakistanis welcoming has also sent a very good message. So while we do not expect uh, immediate tangibles to come out of this meeting, what we see is a positive atmosphere, positive optics. A meeting has taken place. And what Pakistan needs from the United States is a broadening uh, of a relationship, a stability of relationship. It would like United States uh, help in terms of getting rid of the Financial Action Task Force FATF listing. It would help, it would expect United States help in smoothing out the tensions with India. Well, India, uh, you heard some of the comments which, uh, uh, which President made regarding Kashmir have been received very well in Pakistan and very mm -hmm. negatively in India. And Pakistan looks forward to help of uh, United States as much as it could 
uh, with the Afghan Taliban in the Afghanistan imbroglio. Adam Weinstein, do we have the Trump administration accepting and analyzing the situation that Pakistan is ultimately the key to unlocking peace or at least some level of an agreement so that the United States can get the hell out of Afghanistan and some would say cut and run. Is that the context with which we should look at this or the prism with which we should look at Trump being nice to Imran Khan? Well, I think that's the um, context that uh, Prime Minister Khan wants to project. Uh, I, and I, I certainly think Pakistan is one of the keys to peace in Afghanistan, and uh, including Iran, including China, including India. Uh, you need all regional players. We do see some progress happening. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Doha, there were at least informal talks between the government in Kabul and the Taliban, even though they weren't direct talks, because the Taliban has always rejected direct talks with the government. Um, I don't think that the, that President Trump himself has a clear position. And for better or for worse, one of the things you get with President Trump as a world leader is a clean slate. Um, so I wouldn't put too much, uh, I, I wouldn't emphasize his, his position on Kashmir, his position on Afghanistan. I wouldn't put too much weight on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what President Trump does seem to understand is the value of personal relationships and giving validation to other world leaders, which he certainly did with uh, Prime Minister Khan yesterday. And Muid, um, you heard what President Trump had to say about Afghanistan. Let's have a little re-listen to this for a second. If I wanted to win that war, Afghanistan would be wiped off the face of the earth. It would be gone. It would be over in literally in 10 days. So the Afghans have asked for clarification, which presumably is an opportunity for the White House to walk this back, right? Um, what should we make of this, Muid? Trump going, well, I don't want the military option because I could kill everybody if I went for the military option. What does that tell us about um, what he knows Imran, about Afghanistan? Imran, President, President Trump has a way of speaking. What he went, meant in his own peculiar way was this, that the United States has sufficiently powerful, large, humongous military machine that if United States has to really wage a war against the insurgent elements in Afghanistan, it can destroy them many times over in 10 days. But he also meant this is not the way forward, and he wants a peace. Now, as Farah very correctly pointed out, that President Trump is not alone uh, in making decisions. Uh, what matters ultimately is how the U.S. deep state, U.S. military establishment, the State Department, the strategic community that is represented by think tanks and media uh, basically look at the situation. So what we believe, and we have reason to believe in Islamabad is, because we have proximity to Afghanistan, we have all sides, is that President Trump himself would like the United States to completely pull out of Afghanistan. It was his election promise as well. Uh, but at the same time, his, his generals, his military establishment, his intelligence community, his strategic community are not really convinced for a full withdrawal. And we have heard statements that perhaps the U.S. strategic community and the military would like to maintain a large reservoir presence in the five uh, bases in Afghanistan and would like the Afghan Taliban to acquiesce to that presence. And there, mm -hmm. is some, uh, this, there are some hints that the Afghan Taliban might actually be willing to accept a prolonged U.S. presence and might be able to open up a dialogue with the Kabul regime. And that is why Ashraf Ghani was here a few days before Imran Khan's visit to Kabul. And this is what uh, Imran Khan has sort of uh, broadly pledged uh, with, uh, with White House, right. that they will help Afghan Taliban to accept some of the conditions the American administration is putting on the table. Well, yeah. So we have the Afghan government excluded from those talks right now. It's the Americans and the Taliban sitting in Doha. No Afghan <laughs> government at the table. Maybe we'll find them at the table at some point in time. Farnaz. One of the claims from Washington over the years and others, the Afghans have said this, is that Pakistan holds the control to the nozzle of the tap when it comes to the Taliban or the Haqqani network. You mentioned it at the top of the program. So the idea was that Pakistan can at any time decide to support the Haqqani network, to support the Afghan Taliban, to attack American interests, to attack Afghan interests in the country. A couple years ago when I spoke to Khawaja Asif, who was the foreign minister at the time, he said, well, that happened in the past. We don't have that control anymore. And this is something that Imran Khan's also saying. We don't have that control over the Afghan Taliban anymore. Do you believe the Pakistani establishment? 
Well, um, Imran Khan's meetings yesterday um, were the public meetings. The actually the important uh, meetings took place with Pakistan's army chief and ISI chief. Um, and in those uh, talks, um, many, many things were promised by the Pakistani top military establishment that they would be able to help America to resolve uh, the situation vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. The United States has a, a policy, an attempt for the ceasefire and peace uh, in Afghanistan so they can withdraw. But the issue really is um, it's a failing, failing, failing a wish of President Trump's. And as it was rightly pointed out, it was an election promise. And President Trump's already electioneering. So can Pakistan do it? I do think Pakistan absolutely has ties with the Haqqani network. The leadership resides mainly in Pakistan itself. Um, do they still have the same relationship with uh, the Taliban? Um, yes, they do. Mm. But let's look at it from a different lens. I, and I think we need to redirect this. The Taliban are outsmarting the Americans how. They are not, they are still conducting attacks on hospitals, attacks on children's schools, attacks on old monuments. Every day they're killing in Afghanistan. They are not recognizing the elected Afghan uh, government with all the issues it may have. So they are outweighing. The Taliban okay. is outweighing a but US for now, they sorry know to who's interrupt desperate you. Is that, to go. Is that the reason why Pakistan is still keeping its options open just in case the Taliban takes control of the country again? No, Pakistan is desperate. Look, Imran, we are at a point in Pakistan, the economy is in shambles. They may want to put all the blame on Mr. Nawaz Sharif's government. I would certainly not say that. The economy is in shambles. People are really, the price of items, electricity, everything is out of control. And you can have 20,000 people here in an arena in Washington, D.C. The expat Pakistanis are mm -hmm. super patriotic. But in Pakistan, see the kind of public meetings held by the Pashtun Tahafuz uh, movement, by Maryam Nawaz Sharif, by other large political leaders. You see a different scene. The military is here today for two reasons. The economy is hurting, right. and their grip on Pakistan has been threatened to a point. We have two jailed former prime ministers in prison. We have a former president in prison. The press has been muzzled. The mm -hmm. Pakistani military establishment was desperate. And so they presented Mr. Imran Khan as the public optics to come here to, okay. and to right. say, we'll do anything we can. Right. But can they deliver Imran? I'm not sure they can anymore. Yeah, and as we talk, we're looking at pictures of Imran Khan speak at US AID, which has a lot of projects in Afghanistan. Uh, Adam, something that's, that's crucial here is that when they're sitting um, in the corridors of power at the State Department or the DOD or the CIA, or the White House, when they talk about Pakistan helping the situation in Afghanistan, are they considering Pakistan as mediators or are they considering Pakistan as the people who call the shots when it comes to the Taliban? I'm not sure what they think at the State Department or the CIA, but I, I, my personal view is that Pakistan can play a mediator at best. I think in the past, Pakistan has called the shots uh, certainly GHQ, the, the military establishment and the ISI, have had a relationship with the Taliban. Uh, we know about the Kuwait Shura. But I think at this point, uh, Pakistan could play a spoiler. In other words, if uh, the peace process were to progress and Pakistan didn't like the terms, I think they could spoil the peace process. I think they have that amount of influence over the Taliban. But I don't think that Pakistan is um, capable of coercing the, uh, the Taliban into a deal that they don't like. So I think it's a limited relationship that still exists um, with uh, limited influence. And I think that's the way 
uh, U.S. policymakers should view it. Right. Moe, it's something that I think everybody agrees on here is that Pakistan needs money, right? The economy is not doing too great. The IMF loan hangs over Pakistan. Can Imran Khan actually thread this needle where he maintains a relationship with the United States that's political and economic or economically revived, while at the same time opening Pakistan up to the Chinese projects and turning east? Can he thread that needle? That's a very difficult balancing act. Um, uh, those who have watched his speech in the, uh, in the Washington uh, uh, arena, Capital One arena, would actually would have noticed that he categorically praised the Chinese help. Uh, but within uh, Pakistan, there is a realization that perhaps Pakistan was seen too much in the Chinese camp, uh, and many of their expectations have not been fulfilled uh, from the whole um, financial arrangement with China, with CPEC and everything. So there is a desire to create a balancing act between China and United States. And United States in 2015 and 14, when the CPEC was first being unfolded, the U.S. State Department was on record. They briefed the Pakistani media. They said, we welcome a CPEC. We see anything that increases Pakistani wealth creation and structure and liquidity is welcome from Washington's point of view. But then there were several lobbies, including the Indian lobby in Washington, that convinced the uh, the, the U.S. strategic community that uh, China-Pakistan economic coordination relationship is not necessarily in the United States' favor. So Pakistan now wants to strike a balance between China and United States. It desperately needs the United States. There's a very strong feeling, bipartisan, uh, in Islamabad that Pakistan needs to mend this relationship with the United States, not only for IMF and not only for FATF and not only for Afghanistan, but for the reason that the United States is the sole major global power. It is the leader of the Western civilization. Pakistan has a very diverse community over there. It needs educational, scientific, technological relationship. So the relationship with the United States is very crucial from Islamabad's point of view. And Islamabad will do whatever it can. So whereas it is seen as a lot of cynicism, but whatever it is possible and to deliver, uh, the Imran Khan government would try to deliver on that. And I think they're also saying that, you know, uh, understand the limitations. We don't really have 100% control on the Afghan Taliban, but they will try their level best mm -hmm. to, to, to seek and court a Washington and White House. Farnaz, how would you advise Prime Minister Khan to strike that balance? Well, I think it's quite impossible in a certain way. Um, uh, the United States Asia policy is really hinged on an anti-China focus. And, the, and Pakistan owes in loans and in other things for the economic corridor, but also for a lot of other projects, a lot of money. Pakistan is indebted to China. So as all this um, happiness dissipates, we're going to come down to a point where yesterday, um, President Trump managed to upset the Indians, upset the Afghans, and upset a huge segment of the United States establishment, which really feels that Pakistan has been epicenter of terrorism for the entire region in India, in uh, Afghanistan, and also in training uh, people. There have been back-channel uh, meetings where China has uh, told Pakistan off for training certain um, Chinese separatist groups. So this is far more complicated, um, Imran, mm -hmm. for those of us who spend our time um, in scholarship but have had experience in Pakistan's holds of power, um, sat in a lot of these ne negotiations. I was present in the Pakist uh, Pakistani parliament when uh, Osama bin Laden was caught. Um, and all of those things, it's all a web of deceit and lies. Mm -hmm. Will the Pakistani military establishment give up what they have been doing, the games they have played with the lives of Pakistanis and the lives they have played of all of our neighbors, are they willing to give up that power? Right. Is Imran Khan still the boss? Right. I don't feel Imran Khan is the boss, which is why asking what Imran Khan can do to answer your question is not re is moot. Right. It's right. a moot point. Okay, that's an interesting point. And one of the controversial things that he said in an interview with Fox News, I believe, was that 
Well, it was the ISI that gave the Americans the intelligence to get to bin Laden in Abbottabad, which a lot of people turned around and looked at and went, what? Um, it's been good to get a deep analysis of the situation. Adam, Moeed, and Farnaz, I thank you all for joining us on the Newsmakers. George Orwell wrote that he who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Coincidentally, he penned those words in the year 1948, while thousands of kilometers away, Palestinians were being forced out of their homes. Now, seven decades on, the state of Israel is accused of burying evidence of that mass expulsion in a move one prominent Israeli historian has called totalitarian. The allegations were made in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. According to its investigation, the Defense Ministry is hiding documents to delegitimize Palestinian claims to disputed land. And while this might sound like a massive cover-up, officials aren't exactly denying what's happening. And at the same time, Palestinians are still being forced from their homes today. Take a look. Well, joining me now is historian Raphael Israeli. He's a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he emigrated to Israel in the aftermath of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. In Tel Aviv, we have Haaretz journalist Gideon Levy, who works at the newspaper that published the investigation. And in Amman is Palestinian journalist and Middle East analyst Dawood Kutab. Good to have you all on the program. Raphael Israeli, if I could start with you. It's a fascinating report in Haaretz by Hagar Shezaf. It's called Burying the Nakba, How Israel Systematically Hides Evidence of 1948 Expulsion of Arabs. Were you surprised by these findings? Uh, Haaretz is a so-called liberal newspaper which can be accused, rightly so, with a very strong bias against anything that Israel does. It's the Palestinians who are saints, the Israelis are the villains. And with that kind of line, you cannot be surprised at anything that are its rights. I, I have been uh, myself victim of things that they have published on other issues, okay. like the Israeli Arabs, okay, so which let's they take distorted. For a second. Certainly, let's take Haaretz for a second and their standing and their political affiliation, or what you claim to be their political affiliation, and park that off for a second. Benny Morris is not a, a lefty. He's a famed Israeli historian, right? He says this is totalitarian. He calls this policy totalitarian by Malmab, which is the group in the government that is now making unavailable these historical archives. So forget Haaretz for a second. Benny Morris saying, using trying to look for the same sources that he used for his previous books. He went back and tried to revisit them. And when he went to look for them, to look at issues such as Deir Yassin, where Arab villages were massacred, he was told, this is unavailable now. You can't have access to these archives. As a historian, is that acceptable to you, sir? 
I think you mix here many things together. Tell me uh, Benny Morris is my Benny, Benny Morris is my friend, and I respect him very much, and he's a very good historian. But I stand to argue with him many issues about 1948, and I have written even a book mm -hmm. called Old Historians, New Historians, No Historians. And I have there a series of events in 1948 which he misdescribes and he distorted or misjudged. And I argue those matters with him. The other issue which is separate is the issue of state archives who take for themselves the responsibility to release certain materials and to forbid the release of other materials, which even after 40 years or 50 years can still do damage to the country or to its intelligence or to certain individuals uh, who can be hurt and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, it's not for Benny Morris or myself or anybody outside the, the authorities to judge okay. what is hurting okay, so to Israel me, and okay. what is not. So before I bring in the other guests, I just want to ask you about a very specific historical record in these archives, right? For example, now this was something that was previously published, which is now unavailable. That's why we still have access to it. It's from the village of Sufsaf in Safed district, 29th October, 1948. Yosef Vashitz, a member of MPMs, United, Wo United Workers' Party, a Zionist leftist party. Arab section, writing, Sufsaf, they took 52 men, tied them to one another, dug a ditch and shot them. 10 were still squirming. Uh, women came begging for mercy. The bodies of six old men were found. There were 61 bodies, three cases of rape. One of the rapists was a Mizrahi man from Safed. A 14-year-old girl was one of the rape victims. Four men were shot and killed. One of them had his fingers removed by a knife so as to take the ring. So we cannot find this account anymore in the archives. Do you believe that this is justified for Israeli national security? Uh, no, of course, you, you cannot judge one uh, specific event only. Uh, war is a horrible thing. Many horrors were done on both parties, and they were released. And some of them were never relieve, uh, re released to the public. Uh, but that doesn't say anything, uh, because I cannot now take a specific event that you quote I'm giving you an and example. tell you what... Uh, Certainly. But I'm well, giving you an example. You, you, Yes. You quote. You you quote an example. Of course. I, I have to see the quote and to verify whether but, it's but true you, or not. But you sir, you've already. Anything. But sir, you've already accepted the government Malmab's rationale here that it's okay for them to make this unavailable. That's why I'm asking you, and I'm giving you an example because you have already decided that they're right to do this. So that's why I asked. Okay, here's an example of one specific thing that they've now made unavailable. Do you get it? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. If, okay. if okay. you... Okay, okay, fair enough. Let's bring in Gideon Levy. Gideon Levy, um, part of the criticism is that, well, it's those Haaretz lefties who hate Israel, so why should we expect anything other than this nonsense from Haaretz? I've seen some of this uh, as a response from people on the right in Israel. Um, tell me your initial reaction, Gideon, to coming across this information that the archives have been archived, if you like. The year is 2019, and it's hard to believe that this debate is still taking on. There was a Nakba, there was an ethnic cleansing, 700,000 Palestinians had to leave their homes and were never allowed back. Over 400 villages were destroyed and erased without giving them any kind of memory, even not a sign. Me, as a product of Israeli education system, I never learned anything about the Nakba. The Nakba is denied in this country because we believe that if we deny it, it didn't take place. 
but it took place. It never stopped, by the way, until today. The policy remained the same policy, 50, uh, over 70 years now. But in any case, this uh, investigation of Haaretz, you asked before the distinguished uh, professor if it was a surprise. How can it be a surprise when you go around Israel and you don't see one, one single memory of a whole life of a whole people who lived here and half of it has to leave and half of it could never come back to their homes? How can you be surprised that some details in archives were erased when so many villages were erased, you know, with for, covered with forests, covered up with all kinds of stories, and Israel never took any kind of responsibility, moral responsibility to what happened. Dawood Kutab, according to one of the documents that has been redacted, 70% of the Arabs left as a result of Jewish military operations, right? Which is fundamentally the Palestinian narrative to say the vast majority of people were driven out of their homes and they didn't just get up and leave and felt that the Arab armies were going to reconquer and they were going to come back, right? When you read this and you see that some of it has been covered up, do you feel any sense of vindication that the Palestinian narrative of the <coughs> Nakba is getting supported by historical documents or the fact that maybe the Israeli state is trying to cover it up, which means that it strengthens the Palestinian narrative at all? Well, I mean, obviously, we believe in, in, in Palestinian narrative. There is no doubt in our minds. We know it. We talk to people who are relatives. My father is a product of the Nakba. He, he loves his house in Mustara. Our, my cousin was killed in 1948. So we don't need the archives to tell us what happened. But I, clearly what is happening has nothing to do with the security, as the professor said, or we're trying to cover up something for the sake of people who... 70 years ago, who would be 90 years old now, if they were really young, are still alive. I think that's clearly a question of trying to cover up the Israeli narrative and trying to deny the Palestinians' right to have, as Gideon said, that Israel take responsibility, moral and legal responsibility, for causing the Palestinian refugee crisis. Once they do that, then I think we can talk about whether all, most few would return or not. But until the Israelis take responsibility for what they've caused, which is the Palestinian refugee crisis, there is not going to be any resolution to the right of return. Obviously, as Mahmoud Abbas said, Palestinians are not planning to flood Israel. And Mahmoud Abbas said, I want to visit Safad. I don't want to live in Safad. But it's not going to be resolved. There's not going to be historical reconciliation until the Israeli public and the Israeli government allows the Israeli public to understand what happened to take responsibility so that we can have a kind of a resolution in which we can live somehow with whatever has mm -hmm. been left after 70 years of, the, of this Nakba. Right. That's the basic need. Rafael Israeli, one of the things that we're hearing from the other two guests is the suggestion that the state feels the need to, to hide, to obfuscate, to sanitize history so that there's no existential guilt when it comes to the current Israeli population, that they don't have to have any seeds of doubt when it comes to the legitimacy of their state. Is that a worthy goal for historians and for archives? Well, look, the question is a question of good measure, because if, uh, from the discussion I hear now, there is a clear indication that the intention is not to tell a historical truth, but to bash Israel. And that I do not accept. There are horrors that were made in the war, but the Palestinians are not victims or saints because of that. Both sides did horrible things. Uh, the Palestinians, many massacres, and the Israelis, many massacres, too. There were many Palestinians who were killed or who were expelled, and that is true. But they don't tell you that 6,000 Israelis also, 1% of the Israeli population, was killed in that war of 1948 where the 600,000 Jews in the country were battling for their independence. That they don't tell you. All they wanted is to eliminate the Jewish population and its, uh, its uh, striving to independence. That they don't tell you. They, 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 stri they strove to do that. 
and the price that they paid is all the horrors that happened to them. Uh, the horrors are terrible on both sides, but they should not pose themselves as people who have a clean narrative, everything is fine, and those horrible Jews did the certainly. most horrible thing. That the other is two guests, not fair. None of the other two guests have s said any of that. However, Gideon, let me give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a very typical way to describe the Israeli narrative. Israel is al always the victim. As an occupier, Israel is a victim because Israel never meant to occupy for over 52 years the occupied territories. It was all forced on us. Israel was never meant to, to uh, make this ethnic cleansing of 700,000 Palestinians in 48. It was all uh, forced on us, and we are just the pure victim. The second narrative is that it's equally bad. Both sides did terrible things. No, it's not like this, because Israel had, uh, is responsible for the Nakba, and the Nakba contains a national tragedy which was never repaired for the Palestinian people who is bleeding until today. And Israel is a strong regional superpower living in, 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 in freedom, in prosperity, while the Palestinians continue to bleed in the refugee camps, under the occupation, in the siege in Gaza. So, you know, this ridiculous uh, uh, portrait of symmetry between the two parties is obviously ridiculous. Last thing I would like to mention is that the more Israel denies it, and the more aggressive it becomes in archives or in anything else, the more you understand how much Israel feels guilty. Because would we really feel so justice, so just about what happened? What's the problem? Why should we hide? Why do we hide all the villages that were destroyed? Let's put a sign to each village. What's the problem? But we know we did something wrong. We know that the whole moral basis is rotten. And therefore, we have to deny and to hide I wish that Israelis will feel strong enough and just enough to say the truth. Yes, there was a Nakba. Yes, there were crimes. And now it's about time to compensate, to take responsibility, and to open a new chapter. This never happened. Dawood Kutab, I wonder if you see a connection between what we're discussing and what has recently been in the news from East Jerusalem. So Israel won a legal battle against Palestinians in East Jerusalem the residents of uh, Sur Bahar, for a safety issue connected to the wall. They said they, the Supreme Court, by the way, rubber, rubber stamped this, so it's legal. These homes were bulldozed and, and blown up, Palestinian homes, for safety reasons. They don't exist anymore. Now, people are saying uh, among the Palestinian community in East Jerusalem that this is going to be confiscated for settlements and so on. We don't know what's going to happen down the road. But do you see a connection between what we're discussing about the events of 1948 and what's happening on the ground right now in East Jerusalem, Dawood? No, actually, I don't see. I see a connection uh, much more with what's happening in Gaza, with the march of the return. That's where the real connection is, because that's where the product of this uh, Nakba actually exists. I mean, many more Palestinian refugees live in Gaza than in the West Bank. Yes, there are about 17% in the West Bank, but there is over 50 percent of the population of Gaza, which is under siege, which is totally denied access, is, is totally uh, under a big cage. So I see much more comparison there. What happened in Surbaher is actually the, the death, not of, has nothing to do with Nakba as much as with the Oslo Accords, because these are homes that were built in areas mm -hmm. that are supposed to be part of A, areas aid under Palestinian security and administrative control. In other words, the Palestinian government gave the license to build, and they're destroying them, not because of anything, but just because they decided that they want to create a security wall uh, on right. these lands or nearby these lands. So I, I really think the, the issue here is uh, much more connected to the right. wider return right. and of the march of the uh, people in Gaza and the demands of Palestinians to have this issue. Israel recognizes its moral and legal responsibility. Oh, so let me then ask Gideon. Can homes in East Jerusalem be bulldozed and blown up and no one blinks an eye because if you view, uh, if, you've grown, if, if you've grown up on the narrative that the Palestinians don't have a right to be there at all and that no crimes were committed against them, it makes it easier for this stuff 
to happen. Might that be a connection, Gideon? I think there is a connection and I uh, tend to disagree with my friend Daoud because I think it comes from the same place. My problem with the Nagba is that it never stopped, as I said before. The same principles, the same policy over 70 years. Would it stop at 48? I would have agreed with Professor Israeli, every war has its ugly sides, its crimes, and you know, let's continue. But it never stopped. What happened in Subahe yesterday is a direct continuous of the thought that the Palestinians have no right in this land, that only the Jews have the right to live here in equality and in a democracy. Not only this, but also international law. International agreements that Israel is signed on are worth nothing. Right. Because okay. Israel, because of Israel's security. Right. You okay. Know. Raphael Israeli, Gideon Levy, and Dawood Kotab. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, Boris Johnson is Britain's next Prime Minister. But how will he govern with a divided Conservative Party? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.